right, we on? Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Good morning to you. You're a lively bunch. <laughs> I said good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Harrison, and uh, I'm very grateful to you all for this opportunity to share a gospel message while I am far from home. Uh, any chance I have to speak among brothers and sisters in Christ is so special to me. And uh, <coughs> quite honestly, it's been a while. It's, I haven't done much of this in recent years, so it's going to be fun for me to shake the rust off. <laughs> and I'm grateful to Houston, a longtime friend of mine, uh, for stepping off the stage for a week. One part of me would guess that uh, he's happy for the break <coughs> for one Sunday, but then again, I know that, that Houston takes this very seriously, so it's not lost on me the trust that he is showing in this gesture. Uh, this visit kills a couple different birds uh, for my family. <coughs> we've been wanting to spend a few days with the Olivers for years, <laughs> and we've had several children since the last time that we hung out, so we have kind of come feeling like, do we need to reintroduce ourselves to this family or what? But um, Houston and Reagan, seriously, are very rare people, and they have loved us well, even from hundreds of miles away, and we love the Olivers, and uh, this church is in good hands. Uh, Atlanta is also a significant stop on my own eastern uh, pilgrimage for the work that I do. We hail from Arkansas, where I serve as a fundraiser for a nonprofit ministry called Cedar Rock. And if you'd like to hear more about our work, I'm eager to share more uh, during class. <clears throat> but for our purposes now, I'll just say that Cedar Rock is uh, largely a marriage enrichment and restful retreats kind of ministry. My wife and I uh, Kelly, we actually did one last year before I took this job, and it really rocked our world. In fact, God's been shaking up my world in some really good ways, and I'm eager to give you a, a glimpse into that this morning. I just arrived yesterday, so I don't know what your sermons have been about, does, but does it work if I go ahead and talk about God's hope for marriages and families? What have you guys, what have you been talking about? Does that fit? <laughs> So, let's begin in 1 Samuel. Uh, this is uh, about Saul, King Saul. Before I hear any of us go into any diatribes about how he's such a bad dude and, you know, he's always on a big power trip, I just need us to know or acknowledge once again that we all have at least a little bit of King Saul in there. With Saul, we read more and more of the same disappointing news wherever we find him. His is a prideful and envious and foolish story. And 1 Samuel chapter 13 is no exception. Verse 1 in chapter 13 begins, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, which should be our first signal because 30-year-olds don't know anything. <laughs> they think that they know everything, but they don't. And I know this because I'm 35, and I know everything. <laughs> so. But this is 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 1 and go through about 11 verses. So if you'll read with me, uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown and throughout the land said, 
let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Verse 5. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash east of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. And so he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. What have you done? Well, so Saul had done several things, actually. Being that punk 30-year-old that he was, he disobeyed God by not waiting on Samuel. And he placed himself in the role of a priest. And if you read the chapters right before this, it's very clear that God does not want kings acting as priests. God did not really ever want Israelite kings at all. The heart of Saul's sin is this, I believe. He rushed. He'd been in Gilgal for several months, probably even celebrated his 31st birthday, and he was noticing this terrifying shift in the winds. The Philistines were all converging in this region, mounting up a fearsome attack, and he knew with each passing day this battle would be harder and harder to win. Seven days was as many days as he felt comfortable waiting. He knew his job as a leader over Israel was, yeah, 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 something about trusting God and, and uh, leading Israel to trust God. But surely God wanted them to strike while the iron was hot. Saul was watching as the Philistine armies grew and his own Israelite army was scattering. And he decided that the wise thing to do at this moment was to rush, pick up the pace, not wait on God, act now and ask for forgiveness Later, what have you done? It's not out of character for Saul, or the Israelites for that matter. By the time we meet Saul, this is already a pretty strong theme in Israel's story. Whether it's Sarai securing a legacy through Hagar or Moses striking the rock, Israel was already in the habit of building golden calves or, or begging for a king and doing that against God's will. And I think that it's easy to label these sins as pridefulness or selfishness or faithlessness. But what about the sin of hurry? Is that less obvious to us? In a world where your reputation, if you'd permit me, I believe that your reputation often is directly tied to your effectiveness, your efficiency, your execution. Could it be that our haste has caused us to overlook 
the harmful act of fast forwarding God's timeline? What's your rush, East Cobb? Well, speaking of time, you might say, let's look at the time. That's all we have for today, Harrison. Nice to have you. Too. I know uh, <coughs> Houston never goes over 12 minutes with his sermons. That's what he told me. So I can wrap this up if you all want me to. No. I do recognize that this can be a very uncomfortable message. We've all got some Saul in there. We all want it to be okay that we don't wait, that we ignore the sacred boundaries that God has put in place for our protection. We want to override those warning signs all around us as we pressure ourselves and our children to keep up, suppress the stress, and let our souls catch up later. Sabbath's not as important as soccer. Right? I can't stop it here because there is an important truth for us about our families. My prayers before today have been that moms and dads would make intentional plans to put their phones down, to protect mealtimes, let the Joneses keep up with themselves. Sorry if there's any Joneses in this church. <laughs> but maybe even that I might inspire some folks to take time away on a retreat where they could focus on their marriage. Actually, I have wanted that so badly for other people that I have sometimes sacrificed my own rhythms of rest. I'm embarrassed to say. Over this past year in this new job, I have felt such a conviction to help more and more people, more and more people, to slow down their lives, <coughs> that I have sped up my life. <laughs> this is not a new thing. Ministers and pastors fall to this temptation all the time. They want so badly to encourage and strengthen families in their churches that they'll burn the candle on both ends. They'll drive themselves hard, striving and working, praying, and hoping that God will save these families. And then one day they look up and they've lost their own. And though I believe some churches do put some unreasonable expectations on their ministers, I still firmly place the responsibility on those ministers to practice these boundaries. They must express their needs. They must lead and model for their churches, saying no, <laughs> saying no, so that they can personally have healthy spiritual rhythms at home. But hear this, the sin of rushing takes no prisoners. And I pray rest over all of us including these leaders, God, for Nelson and for Linda, for Christy, for Brett, for Laney, and for Houston, and for Blake. I pray for slowness and for peace. I pray for our souls to get the breathing room that is required to become aware of God all around us. I pray for East Cobb to be a place where each person is released of the burden to keep all of the plates spinning. That instead each person here, God, might be invited to rest and receive from the Lord and live an abundant life out of that rest. Amen. Today is actually about uh, two forms of slowing down. I've covered the first one already and I think it's a little bit more the obvious one. We see it all around us. We pack our schedules and we say yes to every 
opportunity. We run on fumes and then we wonder why we're not sleeping very well. Let's rush less and rest more in our external world. The second rest we need is in our interior world. <clears throat> I'd like us to drill down a little bit deeper because our schedule is not the source of our hurry. We hurry in our hearts. My wife is Kelly, and we always get along. It's amazing we found each other, really, because normally I know that husbands and wives have a, a lot to deal with, like disagreeing, and they've got all this baggage that they bring in uh, to their marriage and stuff. But Kelly and I somehow got super lucky. It's been great. <laughs> I found the perfect person that somehow completes me and also agrees with me. I don't know how. <laughs> she still has some trouble knowing when I'm joking, but you all don't seem to have that problem. <laughs> How does it look when I'm not getting along with my wife and I decide to rush that? I'm not talking about rushing me and her out the door to get to the next thing. I'm talking about rushing her to get it together or rushing her by jumping to a solution or being impatient because I don't like how I feel when she is not doing well. Rushing her to agree with me because she's not making sense to me yet. Hurrying in my own heart. I'm talking about rushing in relationship. We do it all the time. And it's very injuring. Parents, <coughs> have you ever jumped to a punishment before figuring out what actually happened? I can think of multiple times where I got sharp with one of my girls and then I realized that the other one was the instigator. <laughs> or they weren't, they weren't disobeying. It's just that they forgot. Three and four-year-olds don't remember what you said 12 seconds ago. They're not trying to disobey. They just don't remember. But, but I've acted out harshly taking their actions as disobedience or the worst one they were actually trying to make me proud <coughs> God loves when parents take time to be curious about their children <coughs> he could do with a lot less punishment and a lot more curiosity with our children. And God's plan for husbands and wives is to settle in to the discomfort of being different people. Don't change that. Obviously, when you disagree as rarely as Kelly and I do, it is, it's hard to think of any examples, <laughs> but we've struggled with potty training and budgeting and in-laws, who gets whose chores, home design, shopping, preschool, church, work, and in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just this last week. <laughs> the problem is not that we're busy. There's something going on inside, a restlessness. For Saul, there's more going on in the story, and it gets to the heart of our own impatience with God and with each other. Time is of the essence, or at least it seems to be. Enemy armies are swarming on those distant hills, and your own people are looking for the nearest exit. Saul is restless, much like I can be with my wife. She comes to me looking for a gentle place to land, and I tell her a better way to handle things with the girls. She shares vulnerably with me, and I start in on how that impacts me. She asks for help, and I make a case for why I'm already doing more than my fair share. Certainly, I'm willing to die for her. But being patient during disagreements, that's, that's another level. Do I wait and ask Marlo questions before jumping to consequences? Do I take 
an extra 60 seconds to let Oakley figure out the buckle on her car seat all by herself. Too often my children get sent to their room when they would really appreciate loving physical touch. They just don't know to ask for that. I have this opportunity each day to embrace my role as a husband and a father by patiently pausing and being curious. But there are times instead where I choose to be sharp and impatient. If only Samuel would walk up to me and quietly ask, what have you done? What I've done is I have grabbed for control where it wasn't meant to be mine. I'm being the king where God's design never had one. Trust. Trust is what we're missing. And when you don't have it, you rush. With trust, we relax and we rest. Without trust, we grab for control. It's good to notice, am I rushing? Am I seeking control? Is that a window into how much trust I feel with God right now? King Saul knew exactly the order in which decisions get made in war, but that involved waiting. So he took over. He did not trust that God would come through. He did not trust that Samuel would come in time. Which is particularly interesting since Samuel literally arrived moments after Saul performed the sacrifice. My own mistrust is what causes me to grab for control with Kelly. It's not meant to be that way. I am meant to rest in my relationship with Kelly. To trust that she is on her own journey with the Lord and does not need my micromanagement. Thank you very much. I know I need to practice more trust in God when I get short with my children. I know I, I don't actually want little soldiers who bend to my will and my every whim. I want these little souls to play and create and not worry constantly about misstepping. I want that for them, but I get so scared about the people they'll become. And deep down... I'm probably scared because I think it's my job to ensure the people they will become. But their heavenly father is trustworthy. He has given me a great task to be sure, but he has not asked me to do this alone. And he is not a God who expects perfect parents. Since we serve a God who is patient with us, we can trust he does not expect us to live hurried and pressured lives. He knew us well enough to know that we would need a full stop once a week. Each week God invites us to pause. Pause our work. Pause our worry. And pause our want. Once a week. Full stop. Work. Worry and want. God did this because he is supremely aware that there's nothing going on in our world that can't wait a day. There's a story in John 11 where we find Jesus sitting with his disciples and he gets a message from Mary and Martha that their brother Lazarus is very sick. And this has an urgent <coughs> tone to it, sort of like you need to be here now. Most of us know that this story ends with Christ performing one of the most miraculous wonders thus far by raising Lazarus from the dead. But there are two short verses that we should slow down and notice today. Starting in verse 5 of John 11, John writes, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was Two more days. First of all, Martha and her sister. I find this so fascinating. Martha and her sister. 
We know this sister. It's Mary. The Mary, okay? Maybe not the Mary, because that's not, I guess that's the Virgin Mary, like Jesus' mom. But this is like Mary who poured perfume on Jesus' feet. It's Mary who sat and listened to Jesus while Martha was just stewing over all of the chores. Jesus loves Mary. And yet, here it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister. Why was Martha the one specifically named this time? Do you wonder if maybe it was Martha's idea to send for Jesus? A little later in the story, Martha comes out to meet Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha rushes. She's like you and me. She has a little bit of soul in there. Martha is a get-it-done gal. And Martha would be the one to feel unloved when Jesus waits. But it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. I've got my opinions about why he waited. But what we know, what we know is that Christ (coughs) did not hurry and he did love Martha. As hard as that may be for her to believe. There is nothing going on in our world that can't wait a day or two. God rested on the seventh day. Jesus certainly took his precious time. He didn't even get started into ministry until he was 30, which I guess ruins the theory that 30-year-olds don't know anything. (laughs) But if this is how our Heavenly Father moves, then do you think maybe, just maybe, he is inviting you to slow down too? Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you Rest, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know, I know, church, that the armies are growing over there. But is it possible that doesn't matter? If you trust God to take care of you, to take care of your spouse, to take care of your children better than you can, I suggest we all rest. Let your inner being take a solid nap. Receive from the Lord the good life that only He can give, that you can never earn or achieve. It's a gift because He loves you. I see Christian men and women doing this every day, choosing not to rush life or rush in relationships. I see parents laying down that busy badge of honor and carving out time to play with their children. I see people like my own brother-in-law, James, (coughs) who confess their struggle with finding identity and salvation, his word, salvation in the work that they do. My brother Houston asked me to tell a part of my story up here. And when I said I wasn't sure, he honored me by saying, hey man, take your time. No rush. Thank you for not rushing the relationship. What a gift. And thank you. Thank you for having me here today, hosting my children in Bible class, and uh, maybe even joining Houston and me for class here in in a little bit. It would be nice to have you. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer, and then I I was going to remember, too, to have people stand. Was that it? Okay. When when I'm finished (laughs) praying, you're going to stand in that order. (laughs) Let's pray. 
Oh God, I pray that today you have spoken through me. And I don't know uh, what we're struggling with here in this room. I've only just met a few of these people. But God, I, I believe that you have prepared me for this day. And I believe, God, that your, your people sit in this room with open ears and open hearts, ready to change. Ready, Lord, to, to wait for you. Ready to trust you with their whole life. God, we release, we release the pressure to earn or achieve or be enough or get enough done or impress. Lord, we are in no rush. We are excited to see what you will do as we receive from you. It's in Christ I pray. Amen.